I'm here with Jonathan Reckford, CEO of Habitat for Humanity. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Rafi, great to be with you. Thank you. So you've helped build and rebuild over a million homes in 70 countries. That's absolutely extraordinary. But there's one term you used earlier. You used the term leveraged philanthropy. Could you tell us what that means? Well, Habitat for Humanity absolutely depends on philanthropy, but uh, a lot of people don't see all that's behind it. So we do take philanthropic dollars, but then we don't uh, give away homes. We sell the homes to low-income families who otherwise couldn't afford to purchase one, and then we recycle their mortgage payments back. So we've got billions of dollars in mortgage receivables. We also run a chain now of over a 1,000 what we call Habitat for Humanity restores that take any used building products or home products, we resell them, and that's about a $600 million business. So Habitat now, actually, I'm proud to say, last year we helped 7.1 million people get new or improved housing, and, uh, and we've now helped 46 million people lifetime to date. That, that's truly impressive, and I'm also really impressed by the complexity of your business. It's not a standard NGO by any means. Right. What we in some ways, the big growth started because initially the goal was build as many houses as we possibly could. Uh, the catalyst in some ways was about 16 years ago, we changed our framing question from how many houses can we build to what would it take to meaningfully reduce the housing deficit in all the geographies we serve. And that's a much more scary question, but it really forced us into thinking about housing ecosystems and how could we make markets work better so that very low-income families could improve their own shelter. The housing deficit very often takes place in large cities, and that's where it's probably hardest to fight. How do you go about that? You know, it's a, it's a whole mix. We, we start with an overall assessment. Uh, rapid urbanization is one of the biggest global trends and very hard to stop. And most cities don't have the infrastructure for their current population, let alone the, uh, the growing population. And that leads to informal settlements and slums in low- and middle-income contexts, leads to overcrowding and people paying very high percentages of their income in rent uh, in high-income contexts. So we've got an affordability crisis, really, in all of them. Our goal, uh, our particular focus is home ownership, helping families uh, be able to own an asset, because increasingly we're divided into people with and people without assets. And so we have a program where we train the families. They actually put in sweat equity instead of a down payment, helping build their homes and their neighbors' homes. We give them training in financial management and home maintenance, and then we give them a no-profit mortgage that they pay back and over time, but it's pegged at 30% of their income. What we're having to do in the very high cost markets is move towards uh, more shared equity or other creative models because the amount of uh, the gap between what people can afford and what a house will appraise for has gotten so large. Uh, but certainly urban is a huge issue, but there's also rural housing deficits as well. It's just less visible. We are approaching easily, or we're probably deep in already times of great economic uncertainty. How does that affect Habitat for Humanity, and what are you doing to mitigate that risk? You know, we're certainly worried. Um, there was a housing bubble in many ways across the global north, and so rates going up probably was needed to slow down the fact that housing prices were going up so much faster than incomes. The bad news, of course, is higher rates mean uh, the affordability has gotten worse. So. In some ways, um, we need to just build more housing. That's going to be the biggest solution in most of these places, uh, which is if we've got an undersupply of housing, uh, too many people are trying to, to acquire the same property. So we're really interested in how do we create the right incentives between public sector, private sector, and nonprofits like Habitat to be able to significantly increase supply. So you've, you've served as an executive at Disney, Best Buy, Target, you started out at Goldman Sachs, in my understanding. You've got, you've got an MBA from uh, Stanford and a BA from Harvard. And you're an executive pastor. So you've got quite a diverse and eclectic background. And uh, how does that inform your leadership style? You know, I, it's so funny. My career never really made sense to me. And I look back now, and all those pieces have been so valuable. So learning finance at Goldman, learning a, a starting new business at Marriott and then Disney, all of them had a real estate component. And then leading a retail chain, um, learned, I learned so much about distributed management. My philosophy, and certainly honed in, in my church service, 
is that servant leadership is the best model of leadership in all contexts, but it's really the only model of leadership in the nonprofit world because really you've got so many stakeholders. Uh, our core behavioral values at Habitat that we really push for are humility, courage, and accountability. And, uh, and we try to hire for and reward and, and promote people who uh, drive for results but do it the right way and grounded in a sense of mission first, not it's not about me, it's about the mission. Well, servant leadership is, as you probably know, a very big part of YPO as well. And our, we, our community standards are generosity, respect, inclusivity, and trust. I'm sure that can resonate with you. And you know, it's a, it's a member-led organization. It's champion-led. Those champions are members who volunteer their time to serve other members. So that's a theme that resonates very deeply with the YPO audience as well. Well, it is, uh, you know, I've had very good experiences. We've had many volunteers, board members, and supporters from YPO around the world. And I've always admired the model of how uh, YPO has created community. But, uh, but also, uh, you know, I'm a pro-business, pro-markets. And, and in some ways, when we look at why housing isn't working, it's because the markets are failing. And so, in fact, getting the markets to work better, I think, is a, is a key part of how, this will, uh, how we can make progress. How do you see business as being a force for good? You know, I'm an optimist about business, and I think uh, here in Davos, I think we see a lot of the best of that, where, uh, you know, if you think about it, if everyone had a good-paying job, um, a lot of our nonprofit work would be less needed. And so I'm a huge believer in creating jobs, creating income, creating uh, products and services that people need, solving problems. So I think business is desperately needed. I think really complex problems require each sector. So government's needed for regulation. Government's needed for creating the enabling environment. But the private sector is much better at building. In, in, in the real estate world, um, governments usually are not very good at building housing. Now, they can create the conditions and the right incentives, but the private sector is the best at building at scale. And then I think you still need nonprofits, which bring the social cohesion and the voice of the community into the mix to, to create sustainable solutions. So the theme here this year is cooperation in a fragmented world. And I know that you personally are very good at bringing people together and bridging very often polarized uh, groups. How do you go about that? You know, an unusual part of Habitat's work is that we engage so many volunteers. And as I often say, that's not really a construction strategy, though we love all our volunteers and we want their muscles and their hearts as well as uh, and their engagement. But the reason we're so focused on volunteers is when you come out and you go into a community, you experience community in a different way. We've become so economically segregated, sometimes racially and in other ways segregated. And on the build site, when people come out to, uh, and build together, suddenly you're focused on what you have in common as opposed to what's different. And I've built with blacks and whites in South Africa and Protestants and Catholics in Ireland and Muslims and Christians in Egypt and Hindus and Muslims in India. And I have even built with Democrats and Republicans in the United States. So it is, uh, you know, miracles can happen. But we, nothing uh, is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And I think what happens is if you first serve together, that allows you to build a relationship that then allows you to talk about difference in a different way. And so I think so much social media, so much of our uh, electronic world is focusing on difference and pushing people apart. I think serving in the community is one of the uh, antidotes to polarization in a way that can build bridges. This is something I think that will be uh, on the minds of many people, but it's probably taboo. People would rather not ask the question, so that's what I'm here for. So yeah. how do you distinguish between true charitable giving and yeah. virtue signaling? Yeah, it's a really complex issue. I, I think our hope, you know, we will not turn down uh, gifts, though sometimes we turn down gifts if, if it really is, uh, is in the wrong spirit. Uh, but what we're looking for are long-term partnerships and strategic partnerships. And I think I'm, uh, I'm odd when I see, um, you often can tell when a donor's heart. And what I learned, I was a little scared when I joined Habitat about the fundraising part. And what I found is rather than it's, Rafi, I want to extract money from you, it's, Rafi, I want to find out what you really care about and then find ways to increase purpose and meaning in your life. And I think we're all searching for impact and purpose. And there are ways to do that through work and ways to do that through volunteer uh, and charitable activities. But it is um, what I see is that, that most people, generosity creates joy. You know, it's, it's when we can visibly see that we're having a tangible positive impact on other people and being a part of that transformation. For most of us, that's, you know, that's what pulls us in. 
Well, it's a great way of looking at it. It's, it gives it a really positive spin, right. and, and I appreciate that. Um, what do you see as being the most pressing global issue today? You know, you'll be shocked to say that, uh, that for, for us, housing, now housing is interrelated with so many others, but in a way, long term, it's not sustainable if we have cities where only wealthy can live in the city. And uh, you're now in London. So many cities that were formerly mixed income have become really economically segregated. And what happened during COVID is everyone suddenly wanted more housing. And the supply chain restricted the uh, increase in housing. So we've been underbuilding housing for much of a decade. And so we saw huge increases in housing values while incomes were going down for a lot of families. So the gap has gotten wider. And what we know is housing is certainly not the only need. But if a child grows up without safe, stable housing, then she doesn't stay healthy, she doesn't do as well in school, then the whole uh, sort of path to independence and sustainability is damaged. So it's not the only need. But in many ways, good housing is a prerequisite for many of the other goods we value. What do you think the YPO community can do to help alleviate that? Well, we would love people to get engaged and in, in three ways, really. First, uh, voice, that, that people of influence can use their voice to say, yes, in my backyard, yes, we want to create uh, mixed income communities. When we think about climate, really, we want, ideally, these 15 or 20 minute cities where everybody can live uh, with access. And, uh, and the cities have been moving in the opposite direction lately, where people are going to go further and further for affordability. So uh, support on um, the policy side is really important. Uh, investing, uh, again, for especially for the YPOs who are tied in some ways to the, the real estate world uh, or financial world, uh, investing in housing, I think, is a great thing. And then third, certainly generosity, where um, I think it's still the math doesn't work. Uh, a good-hearted developer in most cities in the world cannot build something that a, a family in the bottom 40% of income can afford to rent or purchase. So it does require subsidy in some mechanism. And then the question is, how do we use that subsidy to, to have the most impact? Are there specific geographies where you're really having a hard time finding the right partners? You know, I think um, we certainly need more everywhere. I think if you looked at our footprint, Asia's our largest region, then Latin America, then Africa, probably then Eastern Europe and North America. Um, and we, uh, but we've, the truth is we have housing deficits in everywhere. And so, uh, so we love when people get involved locally. One of the things that I have has just brought joy to me is we have a program called Global Village where people go uh, to another context for a week. And if you go to Ethiopia or Cambodia or you know, El Salvador and spend a week building, that will just get your heart in a whole other way in terms of seeing the world differently. And so I think there are lots of ways to, to come and see. But I think that's the first step is come and learn and then, uh, and then see if your heart gets pulled in and, and think about how you might be able to bring your gifts to, to have impact. But skilled volunteers with the business skills of YPOs are desperately needed. Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us today. And is there anything you'd like to leave the YPO audience with? Well, just a huge thank you. Uh, I'm, I have had the chance to get to know many YPOs over the years. Many of you have been uh, huge leaders with, within Habitat. And uh, so thank you for, uh, for the work you do to strengthen your communities. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Rafi. Great to be with you. It's great to have you with us. Thanks so much. Great. Beautiful. Love everything about it.